Anyway, um, question, does anybody that was here last year remember the word that God gave me to share with you last year? What was it? Stamina and endurance. Stamina and endurance. I want to just re review real quick because I love how God speaks. And I shared with you last year that I always ask God for a word for the, for the coming year or, or God, what are you speaking? What are you going to do? And when I was walking with the Lord, he dropped the word stamina into my heart. It was the end of December last year, and I was like, okay, God. And my words to him were, I wasn't thinking of a positive thing, but I was like, oh, no, what's coming? <laughs> Only God. And I remember sharing it with somebody, and you're like, well, it doesn't have to be a negative thing, or, you know, and it was like, okay, stamina. And I remember talking to my son, Timothy, when I picked him up from school, and I was like, Tim, what do you think of when you think of stamina? And he says, running and running and running and running and running. Uh, but, you know, God is good. And I talked about and shared about stamina and endurance in the, in the Word of God. And it's found in three places. God's love endures forever in Psalm 106, verse 1. You got your notebooks and pens because I'm going to give you a lot of scripture tonight. Okay, and the second place was those who endure to the end will be saved in Matthew 10, 22 and 24, 13. So we don't quit. We be persistent in prayer. We talked about the persistent widow. And Jesus uses that and he says, will I find faith on the earth when I return? So we needed to be persistent. We need to have stamina in God's love, in faith, and in prayer. Isn't it amazing how God speaks to us and prepares us for things to come when we don't even know? Because I tell you what, I had to remind myself over and over this past year, stamina. My husband would look at me at times, stamina, honey, endurance, keep going, keep going. And we would remind each other, you know, we keep pressing on. Um, and I just, I'm sharing with you this because I'm nobody special. Well, I am to God. But... <laughs> saying that each one of us can hear from God when we seek him and go after him. And I can remember because from here, I went to national meetings last year, and then after that I shared with the Master's Commission girls, I went and spoke to them, and um, the Lord did give me the word for them that we're gonna, we need to have peace right now in the middle of a storm, and this was in what, the second or third week of February before everything even kept coming, and I was sharing about I really felt like, you know, that something, I don't know, but God wants to give us peace, and the peace that we have in whatever we walk through in life is a testimony to the to the world, that we walk in his peace, and the safest place in the storm or the calmest place in the storm is the eye. You know, and, and so I'm sharing that with them, and I'm sharing with sharing that with you to tell you God speaks when we ask him. He gives us ears to hear his voice when we spend time in his word and in his presence. And how faithful God is. Well, tonight, I don't have one word. Actually, I'll tell you what, I've been wrestling with a lot of things this past month. Just going, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want, what do you want to speak? What do you want to say? And I found myself probably where a lot of you have read Matthew 24 and 25. Anybody else read that? Okay, probably Revelation, but anyway, I was reading in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 um, quite a bit, and there was uh, two words that jumped out in my spirit, and they are keep watch, and I want you to turn to Matthew 24 and 42, and I'm doing this the old-fashioned way, I'm flipping through my Bible with you tonight. Actually, not really the fashion, it's just the way I do it. 
So uh, 2442, and then again in 2513, it's what stood out to me. But I want to read to you um, a few verses in Matthew chapter 24. Because Jesus is telling his disciples about the signs of the, th signs of the times and things to watch and take notice for, for his return. And in Matthew 24, verse 42, it says, So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and find, finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying, and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I want to keep going a little bit. We're going to look at the, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. I tell you, I want to take you through the word because we're going somewhere. Amen. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are running out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or hour of my return. And I want to keep going a little further. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling a small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have, 
will be taken away. Father, right now, I just submit myself to you. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through me. Guide my words and guide my thoughts. And God, speak to each one of our hearts tonight. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, keep watch stood out to me as I read this. And um, we see, just stay with me. Jesus uses the phrase, faithful, responsible servant in verses 45. In the parable of the ten virgins, five were wise and five were foolish. And I used to read that and go, shouldn't they just share? Right? Come on. In our, you know, where we are. Why didn't they just share? Well, that's not what they're supposed to do. That has to do with their relationship with God. And I look, every single one of you got oil and a little lantern to represent this. This is a weekend to fill your oil up. Okay, we're all given oil, and the lamp to me represents the word. Because the Bible says that the yeah. word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay? So five were foolish and five wise. Five had their lamps, the word, and the oil, the Holy Spirit, and their relationship with God, and they were ready. And then Jesus shares the story of the man going on the long trip and leaving his servants with money or talents, depending on the version you read. All got some to him to invest according, it says, to their abilities. Just let that sink in a little bit. And let's jump to the end. Jesus calls the first two what? Good and faithful servants. He called them good and faithful servants. And what did he call the third one? Wicked and lazy. Okay. When I look at those two stories, and I never really connected them like I did when I've been reading lately, because it's so important that we remain faithful. Those virgins were watching faithfully. Yes, they fell asleep, but they were ready. It says they awakened, and they were ready when the bridegroom came. And we need to be ready. We need to be found faithful. I know in Matthew, there's another verse that says, when, he, when we come into his to his presence when we get into heaven and, and he said, he says to them well done, good and faithful servant. You see that all through scriptures when Jesus is talking and so my question to the Lord was okay we're supposed to keep watch for your return right? Yeah. But what do we do while we're keeping watch? We prepare we remain faithful. We remain faithful in what God's called us to do while we're waiting for his return. Because I don't know about you, but I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. So we need to stay faithful to whatever God puts in our heart each day to do. Stay faithful and obedient to do it. Keeping watch for his return. So I looked up faithful. What does faithful mean? Remaining loyal and steadfast. Full of trust and confidence in God. Where's our trust and our confidence? It should only be in Jesus Christ. Our confidence is in him. Because he who promised is faithful. We sang it over and over tonight. And I just got to tell you, my son didn't know what I was speaking on. He sent me the song list and then said, what are you speaking on? That's the Holy Spirit flowing. Pat and I... I mean, I asked her to do something on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we hadn't connected. We don't share. It's, it's the Holy Spirit trying to get things across to us this morning and speaking to our hearts. Okay, I want to take you to Proverbs 3. And for some reason, the Lord wouldn't let me write these out. He said, I want you to turn the pages. So I'm like, okay, I'm doing it. Proverbs 3. Because this is what I do at home. And this is what we need to teach our girls how to do. To study the word. Because I'll get a thought. And then it's like, okay, where is that scripture? So I look it up. Proverbs 3, 1 through 8 says, My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years. And your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people. And you will earn a good reputation. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on all your, under, your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Tie loyalty or tie faithfulness and kindness around your neck. That was a reminder to not let go of faithfulness and kindness. Bind them, the steadfast love in another version instead. Bind faithfulness and steadfast love around your neck. God desires faithfulness from us. Faithfulness in good times and faithfulness in hard times. His word was written a long time ago and it's still true today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change according to how we feel or our circumstance. His word is true. So our faithfulness should not be determined by our circumstances. That we're only faithful when things are going the way we think they should. We want to remain faithful to him until the end because we want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. When I married my husband, it was till death do us part. What are our vows? In sickness and in health. In plenty or in want. When we have money in the bank and when we don't. When you lose a job or when you're continuing to work. God is faithful and we need to stay faithful to him. Have our circumstances this past year affected our faithfulness to God, his word and his call? Or do others see the fruit of faithfulness to God? Because I'm telling you, yes, a lot of things have happened. Some of us have walked through some really rough times. We've lost loved ones. But in the midst of all of that's going on, we have to meditate on the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. Because God is good all the time. We say it, we sing all the songs, but do we mean it in here? Is it real? He's good, he's faithful. Through all of this, in the last five months as I've been traveling, we have testimony after testimony coming in of girls' lives being changed. Everywhere I've spoken, I've seen girls come to know Jesus Christ and accept him as their savior and Lord. Come on, that's good news. Amen. That's good news in the past six months. I've heard testimonies of co-workers coming to Christ because the world is hungry right now. It says that we're supposed to be the light in the darkness. In Isaiah, it says, Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. A deep darkness shall cover the earth, but oh, the, the light that's going to rise up. We are the church of the living God. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, and we are called to be light and salt. And it, Jesus says, what good is it if salt loses its saltiness? It's good for nothing. We need to let our light shine. We need to spend this weekend reviving our hearts in the presence of God. We need to remain faithful. So what do we do? Are there things that can help us to remain faithful and build faithfulness in our lives? Yeah, we, may, we, we remain faithful by filling ourselves with his word. The hurt, what I heard this year was keep watch and the faithfulness, but we are we have to have the word and the spirit this year. We have to have the word and the spirit. We need to be rooted and grounded in the word of God and filled with the spirit of God so we can know when to go, when to stay, when to speak, when to be silent. We need the spirit of God. He's given it to us. It's spending time in his word, memorizing his word. In Revelation 3, I'm not going to go into it, but we need to keep those that first love, that flame. You know, we pray that the fire of God would consume us this weekend, that we would leave with the flame burning bright, and we would take it back into our homes and our churches and our cities because we need to be reignited. We need to be refueled in his presence. We encourage ourselves in the word, meditating on his word, studying his word, declaring his word, spending time worshiping him. I know some of you are in places where I think everybody is back together that's in here at least on Sunday morning. And I don't know, but man, when we walked in on Sunday morning after being away, 
oh my goodness, there was nothing like that worship that Sunday. Like being in each other's presence. Being in the presence of God together because faith spreads. We need one another. So we spend time reflecting on the goodness and faithfulness of God in our lives and throughout the scriptures. Turn over to Psalm 119. Verses 89 through 96. Your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation. As enduring as the earth you created, your regulations remain true to this day. For everything serves your plans. If your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. I will never forget your commandments, for by them you give me life. I am yours. Rescue me, for I have worked hard at obeying your commandments. Though the wicked hide along the way to kill me, I will, keep, I will quietly keep my mind on your laws. Even perfection has its limits, but your commands have no limits. God's word is true. God's word will never pass away. It says heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. It is true. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 11. It says, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the new day, the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. In another version, and I think it's verse 3, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good and live in the land and cultivate faithfulness. We have to cultivate, we have to stir it up, stir up the faithfulness. In Psalm 78, Israel kept forgetting who God was and what he had done. They started looking at their circumstances instead of keeping their eyes and hearts fixed on Jesus. We also remain faithful by being filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit came in Acts 1.8, to give us boldness and courage. It says, and you will receive what? Power. power. Think about it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Power. We need boldness. We need courage. We need power of the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter and helper in John 16, 7. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth in John 14, 21 through 27. We need the word and the spirit to remain faithful to the end. Remember, the word is the truth which we build our lives on. The spirit leads us and guides us into truth. Reality and truth can be different sometimes. I'm going to share an example. Um, I had a day towards the end of last year where I just got really frustrated sitting at my computer at home and just a lot going on. And I just shut up my computer and I looked at my son and I said, I'm going to walk on the beach. And that means I'm going to walk with Jesus because that's just my spot. I'm 30 miles from the beach. I'll drive and just walk on the beach. And so I remember going down and I was going to pray, but first... I was going to ask God questions because I don't understand. And so I sometimes I sit and dad, dad, I don't understand why, you know, somebody's sick or I don't understand why they lost a loved one or I don't understand why we're walking through a season with no job or I don't understand why these things are happening. And I just started going and going and I'm telling God, 
like everything on my heart and everything on my mind because he knows it anyway, okay? You can be honest with him. But this is the thing. I stopped and kept walking and listened. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God rose with me and said, but, God, you are good. God, you are faithful. God, you, are, you never leave me and you never forsake me. God, your word says that you provide every need that we have. You know how many hairs are on my head and they fall out daily? You know, God, you know our needs. It says that when we seek your kingdom first, that all these things shall be added unto us. That we don't have to worry about what we eat or drink because God knows those things. And he's already making a way. We sang that song, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, even when I don't see it, you're working. Well, do we really believe it? He is working. Even when we don't see it in the natural, he is working. And I had to stand there. And all of a sudden, you know what happens when you do that? When you remind your spirit and you tell your soul, this is who my God is, faith comes alive in your heart. And that's what you have to do. It's not time to sit back and just let things happen. God is calling us to the front lines. You are in a war. May I remind you, when you ask Jesus Christ in your heart, you entered a war. And the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So come on. You know the scripture. I never understood it where it says that the violent take it by force. With that scripture. You know what that is? That's not violence. That's violent faith. That's God, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to stand on your word. It's just what Josiah said that we sang. There's another in the fire. And how those men answered and said, if God saves me and rescues me, great. But if he doesn't, he's still God and I'm not bowing. Yes. Yes. And we've got to get that violent faith within us that we trust and believe God, that we take him at his word. Yes. That was Holy Ghost. You've got to find this spot again. <laughs> The other thing I noticed in the parable of the servants, and I want to jump back real quick. Why didn't the third one do anything with what he had been given? Fear. He was afraid. Fear. fear. And it says that in the word of God. The third one, he had fear. Jesus called him lazy and wicked because he did nothing. He let fear fill his mind and did not act, and he bore no fruit. Fear is the number one thing the enemy throws at us. He gets us to question God, question God's goodness and faithfulness since the beginning of time back to the garden. Did God really say? He does the same thing with us and we can play it over and over and over again. But fear keeps in, it creeps in and it keeps us in this place that we don't fulfill God's plan and purpose for our life because of fear. Fear of man, fear of failure, fear of rejection. Whatever fear that is, he throws it and it creeps in. And the what ifs start playing in our mind. Anybody else deal with the what ifs? What if this goes wrong? I can take you back to Powett 2019, since we've been having it in 2020. Standing there going, God, I know you want to move and do something Saturday night, but it's raining. <laughs> and having people bringing me their cell phones telling me a storm is coming. Standing there trying to hear from God. Knowing in my heart God wanted to do something. But I had to let that faith. I mean, I turn around. I don't make decisions by myself. I have a team. Turn around. Rachel's back. You good? I can't find Deborah. I don't know where she was. I turn around. Pat and Wayne. Standing there. Put their raincoats on. My pastor's wife always comes. She works in the kitchen at Powett. I went up and I stood beside her. And we are standing there singing how strong God is, if you remember. And all of a sudden, the spirit inside of me just rose up and said, God, if you are so strong, like we're declaring, then you're going to do something and you're going to protect. But you know what? The what if? What if there's a stampede going across the bridge? What if lightning comes? What, I mean, the what ifs were going crazy in my mind. And I had to take my thoughts captive and say, I'm hearing the spirit of God. I have a witness of two to three. This is what we're going to do. Amen. Girls were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and set free. We have testimonies from girls, from leaders sitting in this room tonight. Girls that had shame washed off. So what if we didn't push through? I'm tired of 
living in that place. It's time to push through. Because God wants to show his glory. I want to take you because I've been there all year. God gave me Gideon in March when this all started. And we're going to go to Judges chapter 6 and 7. Because this has to be established in his word. And I'm trying to show you tonight. It is in his word. It is his word. Judges 6 and 7, it talks about Gideon. Again, I'm not going to read all of this, but again, the Israelites turned away from God, found themselves, you know, surrounded by the Midians. They had forgotten who they were, and they had forgotten really who God was. They were God's chosen people. So everybody knows that God called Gideon, but let's look at him for a little bit because I saw something I never saw before when I was reading through this. I never thought of Gideon being resourceful. I think it was my husband that said that when we were discussing Gideon one night. He was resourceful. He was what? Threshing wheat where? In a wine press. press. Now, yes, you could sit there and go, he was fearful. Yeah, it's obvious. We're going to talk about that. But he was being resourceful. He didn't quit and give up. Okay, so how can I thresh wheat, and then not take my wheat because I have to feed my family. Never thought of that before. But I'm sure God did, and God saw him as being resourceful. And God called him a mighty warrior. The angel shows up and says, you're a mighty warrior. And here's Gideon hiding. Okay? Gideon gives every excuse in the book. Does he not? Come on, I'm the least, and my youngest in my family, the least tribe, everything, because he was afraid, and it says he's afraid. But you know what, God, God, you know, it's okay if you're afraid. Let's, let's keep going, you know? And so Gideon even um, says, okay, God, I'll, I'll put the fleece out. You know, he puts a fleece before the Lord. You know, if, if uh, it's dry and, and then wet the, between the ground, and he does that. And God shows himself that he's with him. And God says, I've called you, and I, I'm giving the Midians into your hand. And you read this through chapter 6 and 7. Okay, so it gets down into chapter 6, and it says in verse 33 that he called the armies together, okay? And it says in verse 34, I love this, then the spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. (laughs) But actually, I'm going to back up a little bit here. Okay, yeah, I love that. And he blew the ram's horn, and he calls all the men in. So he gets this army together. Anybody know how many people there were? 32,000 men, okay? Here's Gideon, afraid, but now all of a sudden God showed himself to him, and, and, he, and, and he's, there's a few other things in there, and again, I'm not reading it all, but all of a sudden, you know, he's like, okay, calls the army, 32,000 men come together. God says to Gideon, hey, Gideon, that's too many guys. So what does he do? God tells him, tell them, what's the first thing? Go home if what? You're scared. If you're afraid, go home. So five people left, right? 22,000. That left him with 10,000. 22,000 said, you know what? I, I'm, I'm afraid. This like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not in. Not doing this. So they leave. Okay. You know why? And this is Barney's thoughts. This is okay. This is I'm telling you. This is my thoughts. Fear spreads. And I'm going to prove it and back it up in a little bit. But fear spreads. Fear is a spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear spreads. Okay. Faith also spreads too. Just a little side note. So who are you keeping company with? Okay, the second. Second to go home. Those who lap the water put their faces down into the river, send them home. Those that stay and cupped it and brought it to their mouth, they're the ones who are going to stay. And, I, and I've heard this, and the word of God doesn't say it, but my husband and I were talking about it, and he's like, they were keeping watch for the enemy while they were drinking. I'm thirsty. My desires come first, sticking my head down. They were keeping watch. So how many men are left? 300. 300! Woohoo! We're going to defeat the Midianites, who it says their army was like locusts. Anybody else ever had 
have locusts in their yard? I do. And they don't come in ones. And they're hard to get rid of, okay? But 300 men. So you know what happens next? Spirit of fear comes back and visits Gideon. God says, he used it. He called Gideon, remember? God says, Gideon, you're afraid? Go down and listen to the enemy's camp and see what they're saying. So Gideon takes the buddy, goes down to the enemy's camp. He hears a guy, guy number one, telling guy number two his dream. Okay? Their dream is a loaf of barley rolled down the hill into the into tent in the camp and knocked it flat. That was the dream. Guy number two looks at guy number one and says, that means that God is going to give Gideon the victory. I don't know how they got that out of that dream, but that's what they got. And Gideon hears it, you know? Gideon hears it, and he's like, God's with me. We got this. Okay? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there goes Gideon, and he calls the men in. Look, we 300, God's given us the victory. So go get your guns and swords. No. Now they have to go get what? Clay plants. 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 Clay pot. Clay pot, a pitcher, and a torch. Yep. And what was in this hand? Sword? A trumpet. <laughs> Not what I would choose to go to war with. So you know what? I, when I was reading that, I'm like, no wonder the first one's afraid had to go home. <laughs> because can you imagine going into battle with that? But look, they had faith because they didn't leave, so they weren't afraid. They had faith in God, but they had faith in their leader in Gideon. Amen. And God was with them. And you know what happened? They got the victory. But I just want to share you a little side note that hit me way back in March and April when I was studying this. Because at the end of chapter 7, after they had gotten the victory, it says, Each man stood in his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew the ram's horn, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places as far away as Bethsheba near Zerera and to the border of these other two places. And then Gideon <laughs> sent, listen, Gideon sent for the warriors. He called back, come on, let's go pursue the enemy. To the ones that had left before. Come on. Isn't it easier now to believe? Because they've watched God show himself mighty. But he didn't say anything bad about them. He said, come on, join us, let's go get the enemy. God gave Gideon the victory. We can't let fear take over our hearts and minds and keep us from being faithful and fruitful. Because the reality of the situation was Gideon had 300 men with pitchers, torches, and trumpets going against an army that was vast like locusts. And God gave them the victory because the truth is what God says in the situation. Numbers 13 and 14. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. We, hear, we read the story of the 12 spies sent into the promised land. God had already told them, I've given you the promised land. Had he not? He already told them. So he sends 12 men in and says, hey, scope out the land and come back and give us a report. You all know it. 12 men went in. 12 came out. Two came, two came in and said, yes, wait till you see what God's going to give us. We can do this. And the ten, other ten spread fear in the camp and said, but you didn't see the enemy. Look at how big they are. They saw they were sent into the same place. We came back with two different reports. Joshua and Caleb God gave them grace and showed his favor upon them because he allowed them to enter the promised land. But because of fear and unbelief that spread through the camp, God said, you know what? You're going to wander for 40 years. And you're going to die off. And then I'm going to bring you into the promised land. 
I'm tired of wondering. It's time to enter into what God has called us to do. Okay? God's plan for that moment in time was victory. He had given them the promised land. He had told them that it was theirs, but they didn't believe. Esther chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Esther took courage and faith. It took courage and faith for her to go before the king. But what was her attitude? I'm going to do it. If I perish, I perish. But she was going to act and be faithful to God and her people. We can go to Nehemiah. That was another book I read this last year, and I made the team read it with me. Nehemiah continued building the wall in great oppression. Chapters 4 through 6, we see the enemies getting enraged that the Jews were rebuilding the walls of the city, but they didn't stop. You know what they did? They picked up a weapon in one hand and kept working with the other until that wall was built because that's what God had called them to do to build the wall. They remained faithful to the task they were called to. They rebuilt the wall in 52 days. 52 days. They covered each other. They worked together side by side, building the wall, sticking to the task. When the enemy was surrounding them and taunting with them, they remained faithful and God showed forth his glory. Come on. Some of our favorite stories in the Bible are all about faith in God and courage. The whole Bible is, if you go from the beginning and to the end, Noah building an ark. It had rained. That's in Genesis 6 and 7. And God showed his glory and sent the rain, but God rescued Noah and his family. God had to work, Noah had to work hard and stay faithful to the task that God called him to in the midst of rough circumstances. Daniel in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6. What did Daniel do? The king makes a decree. Daniel didn't stop praying. He kept praying to his God with the windows open. And they threw him in the den of lions. And he said the same thing, basically. If I perish, I perish. But God is still God. And God showed his glory and showed his might. Mary, in Luke 1, 26 or 56. Come on, Mary, a teenager, Mary, the son of God. She was ridiculed and outcast because she was a virgin that was pregnant. But she walked through it and endured. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3. Deborah in Judges 4. Deborah had to go to battle with Barak because God told Deborah, look, I'm giving him the battle. And Barak said, I ain't going unless you go with me. And God said, you know what? The hand of that, the victory is going to be given into the hands of a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joshua chapter 6. Let's march around the walls a few times. See what happens. God's plans are, they don't always make sense here. We have to learn to discern the voice of God. And we do that through his word and by the relationship with the Holy Spirit. David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. Saul and all the men of Israel were sitting against, sitting there against the Philistines. And David comes to camp and says, basically, have you forgotten who God is? Saul's plan was to sit and didn't do anything. David came in and he said, have you forgotten who God is? We are God's chosen people here. And God has given us the victory. And it took the strength of the Holy Spirit, it took God, David building that relationship with God while he was tending the sheep. He was writing the Psalms, singing and worshiping God, getting to know the Father in his voice. Jonathan, I love the story. Jonathan scaling the mountain, conquering the Philistines with just his armor bearer in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 through 23. His belief, this is what... This is what he said. This is what Jonathan said. He said, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Read the story if you don't know it. But Jonathan and his armor bearer, Jonathan's like, let's try this, you know, and see what's, what's going to happen. The armor, armor bearer looks at him and says, do everything that God has put in your heart to do. I'm with you. So two of them scale up this mountain. And he's like, hey, if they come at us, that's God telling us, we got this. <laughs> but that's what happened it's in the word of God it's true that's right. God gave them the victory the disciples come on they were beaten so many times and they all died for the sake of the gospel 
Paul wrote much of the New Testament while where? In prison. God doesn't call us to be safe. He calls us to be obedient, fully trusting him. He calls us to walk and be faithful to what he's put in our hearts to do. Each one of these people could have stayed still and not moved with God, but they chose to say yes to God and the plan and the purpose that God had for their lives. There's going to always be critics, but we have to fine tune our hearing to hear the voice of God. Spending time in his presence, spending time in his word, talking through him throughout our days, listening in for his voice. The critics are the voices that operate out of fear. What if God doesn't come through? We have to stop sometime, and I had to do this this past year. Stop. Is this decision and this thought coming from fear or coming from God? And I did. I literally had to stop, okay? Because if it's fear motivated, then it's not God. Because God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. Yes, we use wisdom, but I just gave you a hundred proofs. And there's more in the Bible that God's wisdom looks a whole lot different than ours. So we need to make sure we learn to discern the Father's voice. We need to make sure that our lamps are trimmed with oil, the oil of his presence and the oil of the Spirit of God. That we have that lamp, the word. The word is our weapon. It's a sword. I want to be a team. Well, I want to be on a team with people who play to win. I played sports through high school. I want to go into the game with a mindset, we're going to win. I'm not going in to lose. Even if they're better, and we didn't have the best basketball team, but even if I didn't matter, I wanted to win, and I was going to do everything that we could to win. I was going to play my best, and I expected my teammates to play their best too. My son, Timothy Bold. And their team went to uh, got into districts last year, and um, Timothy was the the cheerleader on the team. I'm telling you, and it was cool watching my son. But we went, we got to districts, and I anybody else bowl like I like he just started bowling. Oh yeah, Sadie did because she, and I'm like I have no idea like anything about bowling, and I, oh my goodness, bowling parents, like I was shocked. I mean I expected football but bowling. So, so anyway, so we go, we go wherever we had to go for districts, and we get in there, and okay, there's ten frames in bowling. The kids get like to the second frame, and they had two bad frames, and the parents like, this is a bit, they're gonna lose. I mean, every negative that Tim would come, he's like, mom, and I'm like, pick them up, pick them up, and that was his job, picking them back up. They won, they made it to states, but the parents, I'm looking at these parents, I'm going. There's eight more frames. Yeah. They can come back. You know, there's eight more frames. We, I have, everybody has a bad frame in life. Yeah. But there's a comeback. Yeah. You know, and I watch them come back. And I had parents come to me during districts saying, what is your son on? <laughs> I said, Jesus. <laughs> because they didn't understand how he could stay so positive when everybody else was negative. And I did, I had a parent ask me what he was taking. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus, you know? And they watched us. And I found out that there were two other people, parents on the team that were believers, but like the rest of the team's watching us like, and it was an opportunity for us to be light in the darkness. We haven't been called to hide, we've called to be the light. And that was a testimony to every young man that bowled on his team and their parents. And the cool thing, just side note, so one of the ladies needed a, a ride to, to the game. So um, she called me. So she gets in my car, pick her up, and of course I'm gonna start a conversation. So I start the conversation, come to find out. She had gone to a Christian high school when she was growing up. Now every other word out of her mouth, you know. But you know what? God, that was a God ordained appointment in that car that day. You know, and she didn't get saved at that moment. But I got to plant seeds. Yeah. And I tell you what, she did everything she could to find another ride home. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I will tell you, I didn't preach at her or even say anything. She just saw our life and what we stood for and rep what we represented. Yeah. And then to come find out, one of the other moms who's now become a pretty good friend of mine, 
used to pray for her because she lived in the same apartment buildings for a little while. I mean, that's just, isn't that cool? I mean, I'm looking, I'm like, wow, God, you are amazing. But anyway, okay, back to, back to the story. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be obedient. I love Mark Batterson. He actually wrote a book called All In. If you haven't read, read it, it's amazing. He says in this quote, faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell and taking back the enemy territory. Come on, all through scripture we see men and women who are faithful to fulfill what God had called them to. Their faith was in God, not the outcome. Again, back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Back to, you can read through it. God, Esther, I'm going to go before the queen. I mean, I'm going to go before the king. If I perish, I perish. Their hope was in Jesus Christ. Their hope was in God. Our job is to be faithful and obedient. I want to take you through just a couple more because I believe it's time to strengthen our grip, to take courage and remain faithful to what God has called us to do. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 33 through 39. And actually, I want to challenge you and live them by night. It was God's presence that set them apart. That they were God's people. We need to be people of his presence. We carry his presence everywhere we go. We carry the love. We carry the mercy and the grace, the kindness, the compassion that this world needs right now. We're called to be his hands and feet. We are his plan A. It's us. He's called us to go and make disciples of all nations. He's called us to minister to the girls that he brings across your path each week. However that is connecting with them right now, connect with them. Be faithful in what he's called you to do. Carry his presence. In his presence, it's where we find strength, wisdom, and the peace to continue on in faithfulness. Isn't that so cool? He tells us to do something, and he says, and I'm going to equip you to do it. I've got everything we need. Mm -hmm. He has everything we need. It's in his presence where we gain the strength. It's in his presence where we gain strategies. If I can ask the worship team to come. It's in his presence. Sometimes I just have to go into another room or, and just put on the worship music and just sit in his presence or go walk on the beach or get up earlier in the morning and just sit in his presence. So I don't know about you, but I'll tell you this, last, last year it would be like I would sit in his presence and get so refreshed and then three hours later my mind was going <laughs> crazy like like, okay, wait a second, God, I know I heard from you. Where's that peace? Mm -hmm. And he says in his word that we need to let the peace of God rule our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That he leads us forth in peace. We are to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. I'm not going to preach that tonight. <laughs> but peacemakers. Walk in his peace. Be a peacemaker. Walk in his love. Walk in his presence. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in his word. Let's make sure our oil stays full this year, ladies. That we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, listening for his voice. That we're filling our lives with the word of God and the truth. Shut off the television. Shut off your social media. Shut it off. You have to shut it off. And listen in to what God is saying. Because God is our reality and God is our truth. We move with God, staying faithful, walking in obedience to what he's called us. Because what he's called you to has not changed. What he's called you to, ladies, if you're here, you're called to minister to girls. That has not changed. Our circumstances and situations may change, but the call of God on your life has not changed. You're what the world needs right now. 
It's Jesus shining through you. I had a thought. If scriptures were still being written, what would they be writing about us right now? What do I want my story to be written to? And some of us may find ourselves stuck in those two frames like the bowling. But there's eight more frames. So this weekend, God can renew you and refresh you. Ignite a spark. Ignite a fire. Ignite a dream. Ignite a passion and a purpose inside of you. Because His call on your life and His love for you has never changed. There's nothing that we can ever do to separate us from God's love. Isn't that awesome that the Bible says that while we were sinners, He died for us. He loved us so much that He made a way. And he's calling us to be the light. He's calling us to walk by faith and not by sight, to trust him, to depend upon him. So I want to give you some time tonight, and, and the worship team's going to stay in play. And I know altar ministry looks different right now, but if you want to make an altar right where you're at, if you want to come up, you are welcome to. I will put a mask on. I will stand 10 feet from you. I will hug you. I will do whatever you want. I mean, but I want you to spend some time you and God. And allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. I am here. Anybody on the team is here to pray with you, to minister to you. Because that's what this is all about. But I also know the Holy Spirit can touch you in a powerful way. So I want to just spend some time in His presence. Maybe there's some things tonight that you've allowed to grip you, or maybe you've walked through some, some hard times because some of us have really been through some really rough things this year. And maybe you've, all of a sudden, that's turned into a little bit of bitterness because you're holding on and you just don't understand. And maybe tonight God's dealing with that, saying, let me heal you, let me hold you. Because I'm still God, and I haven't left you. I'm right here. So let him love on you. Let's surrender again tonight to him for his will, his purposes, his plans for our life this year. It's just that good that he called you this weekend to come away. And says, let me love on you this weekend. Let me refresh you with you. Thank uh-huh. you.